Stand by. Behind the mic. Radio. With the switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. But radio isn't all on the surface. There are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy and information that are behind the mic. And now, presenting a man whose name since the beginning of broadcasting has been a byword in radio, Graham McNamee. Thank you, Charlie Noble. Thank you. Behind the Mic presents radio's most loyal fan. L ladies and gentlemen, there are fans who write in for tickets and make it a point to attend as many of the studio broadcasts of their favorite programs as they possibly can. But I venture to say that no fan has appeared in the studio audience as often as our next guest, Miss Wilmar Gray. Miss Gray, about how many broadcasts would you say you've personally attended? I've never counted them, Mr. McNamee, but I'd say I've been to an average of three broadcasts an evening for six days a week during the last five years. Wow. <laughs> an average of three broadcasts an evening for six days a week during the last five years. That means altogether, during the last five years, you've been, uh, let's see, uh, uh, 652 times, mm, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, 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 how do you get entree to these broadcasts? Uh, what do you do, tear off the top of your neighborhood grocer and write in for tickets? Yes, I write to sponsors for tickets, and then again, some programs put me on their regular mailing list and send me tickets every week. Miss Gray, before you were born, your mother must have been frightened by a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> what other type of entertainment do you like besides radio, Miss Gray? Well, I like the theater, too. Oh, you like the theater. About how often do you go to the theater? I was to one about two years ago. Oh. <laughs> I see. Uh, and, uh, and if you didn't like the theater, you'd probably go very seldom, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. uh, what kind of radio programs do you prefer to see? I prefer dramatic programs, you know, like Arch Obler's plays. Well, why do you prefer the dramatic programs? For one thing, I like to see them make the sound effects. Well, don't they have sound effects on comedy programs, too? Yes, but the jokes. Oh. <laughs> Radio depends so much on illusion, and a lot of broadcasts are written simply to be heard at home. Can you really enjoy seeing so many of these broadcasts? Yes. You see, I can just sit in the studio and shut my eyes and imagine I'm at home. Well, <laughs> isn't that a little waste effort, Miss Gray? Uh, I mean, uh, imagine going to a broadcast and shutting your eyes so that you can imagine yourself at home when you could stay at home in the first place and be home without having to go to the studio and shut your eyes so you could imagine you were at home. Uh, if you know what I mean, I don't. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> well, Miss Gray, what was the biggest thrill you ever got at a radio broadcast? Well, that's easy. The time I sat in the control room. Control room. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's the sanctum sanctorum, where the engineer and the man who directs the show sit and work. Well, I'd always wanted to sit in the control room, and I told some of the girls in my office where I work as a secretary, and they wrote to the president of the Firestone Company about me. And what happened? Well, he wrote a letter to the producer of the program saying that I could sit in the control room for a broadcast, and I did. And that was your biggest thrill? In radio. In, oh, in radio? Uh, well, Miss Gray... Uh, Excuse me, uh, Mr. McInerney, but I must be going now. Why? There's a broadcast down the hall, and I simply got to get there if I'm going to get a seat. Oh, well, thank you, Miss Gray. Thank you very much. And by the way, Miss Gray, if you can get me a ticket for information, please, I sure would appreciate it. <laughs> Now presents an amazing story about an NBC page boy. 
Three years ago, a 21-year-old page boy who had been with the National Broadcasting Company for a few months was called into the office of the supervisor of pages and prepared to take a bawling out. This is what happened. Uh, you sent for me, sir? Yes, Livingston. I've been looking over your late record, and it's pretty bad. Yes, sir. According to your record, you've been late on an average of twice a week ever since you've been employed by NBC. I'm sorry. Being sorry doesn't excuse it. We don't ask much of you. Your hours aren't hard. Let's see, you've got the evening shift. You're on from 5 in the afternoon to 1 a.m. And it's only a five-day week period. There's nothing very demanding about that. You don't have much to do besides collecting tickets at the broadcasts and showing people around the studios. Now, the next time you're late, you're through. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. I guess I'll just have to resign. Well, if you feel that way about it, why, I suppose you see, more to... You see, I can't help being late. I've got to fly down to Baltimore about twice a week. Fly? Down to Baltimore? Yes, I'm on the board of directors of a little business down there, and I've got to fly down to attend meetings and sign papers, and sometimes those meetings run pretty long, and I get back here, and I'm, I'm late. You're on the board of directors of a little business? Oh, it isn't really so little. As a matter of fact, it employs about 3,000 people. It's, <laughs> it's part of a family estate that I just inherited. Oh, say, I hate to give up this page job. I really do, but I guess I'll just have to. Billy, that's a mighty interesting story. But one of the things I'd like to know is, why did you ever become a page in the first place? Well, Mr. McNamee, I always wanted to get into radio, and that seemed about the best way for me to do it. At least I'd be around the studios, and that was something. And, and then I wanted to show I could get a job on my own merit, and I did. All of which goes to show that there's more to you besides a reputation as Cafe Society's glamour boy and Brenda Frazier's close pal. Incidentally, you've done more in radio than just being a page boy, haven't you? You've been doing some acting of late. Yes, I have one of the leading roles in the daytime serial Society Girl. And I've played parts in quite a few other radio shows, too. Yes, and you've done a mighty good job with them, too. But thank you, Billy Livingston, very much. presents the story of how a radio engineer became a top-notch comedian. Back in 1932, working more or less industriously in the engineering department of NBC, was a young man named Ward Wilson. Hey, Baker, get off the air. <laughs> Yes, lately he became famous as Beetle in the Phil Baker Show. Ward used to specialize in working with field units. Now a field unit, in case you don't know, and why should you, is a group of men who set up equipment for a broadcast that originates outside of the studio and is then transmitted to the studio and sent over the air. You know broadcasts from hotels and conventions, baseball, football, and so forth. Now, one of the duties of an engineer on a field unit is to test his microphones and other equipment before the broadcast begins to see if he can be heard back at the broadcasting station. And he does this in a two-way conversation with another engineer in the studio. Now, most engineers have certain stock phrases they use to see if they can be heard. They count up to 10, for instance, or they repeat the manufactured phrase, woof, woof, innumerable times. But Ward Wilson was different. To show you how different, we take you back to 1932, with Wilson out on a field unit covering the National Open Golf Championship. Hello? Hello, 7-Eleven. Now, Wilson coming up for a test from Fresh Meadow. Hello, Ward. Go ahead. Hey, is your subset weak or is it mine? I think it's mine, but go ahead. Okay, coming up. Woof, 34. Woof, 28. Woof, 40. Okay, Ward. How about crosstalk? Hello again. This is Jack Benny about to lay the first egg on the second program of our new series. Okay, Ward. How about Crosstalk? Uh, Phil Collins in the studio, and you got him listening to you. Yeah, well, it serves him right. I ran into the happiness boys today at the golf matches. Billy Jones wants to be remembered to you. Oh, say, you know who's down here? Amos and Andy. I never saw him look so worried. Uh, what are they worried about? Well, Amos, he thinks the public's getting tired of him. Uh, go on. I think they got another. 
a year left anyway. I guess so. Uh, say, Ward, you better test emergency for crosstalk. Okay. Uh, this is Rat, Rat Roy Well, or Oi Ratwell, or Ray, Ra, Ra, uh, no, Roy, Roy Atwell, yeah, yes, Roy Atwell, and it's, it's certainly smell, or sell, I mean swell, to, to squeak, or that is sneak, I mean speak, on this auspicious position, or suspicious suspicious, or malicious explosion, I mean, no, a delicious ovation. Oh, oh, well, let it go, let it go. <laughs> okay, for crosstalk. Sounded like Roy Atwell in person. Hey, uh, we got a few minutes to kill. Uh, how about doing that Greek dialect of yours? You know, your imitation of that vaudeville actor, George Gibbon. Say, I ought to be charging you guys up there. <laughs> well, I suppose the ham will out, so here goes. Uh, ladies and gentle pimples of you 90 schnapps, <laughs> is what makes me for to suffer with terrific harpiness, <laughs> what I'm getting up opportunity to graze in your radiator faces and undress you. <laughs> Greeks is was great peoples. <laughs> Greeks is was great riders. It was one Greek is riding most from any. His name's uh, Anonymous. Mo Anonymous. <laughs> he writes one hunk of stuff which is positively docky. <laughs> it goes like this. Uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Up above the sky so high. Like a rainbow, believe me. <laughs> so much stuff. But my subject tonight is what's terrific hunk of stuff. It was called Oranges from Human Bims. Where is come from? What memes that cracks? <laughs> oranges from Human Bims. Oranges from Human Bims is was grapefruit. It's be why we got so many lemons. <laughs> to prove that the oranges from Human Bims is was grapefruit, take Napoleon, he was a little squirt. <laughs> but what I'm going to say, I got a restaurant, Acropolis number seven, 42 Street Times Square, open on night stables for ladies. <laughs> we got a blue plate lunch for 75 cents. It's the most sensational and colossal dinner what you ever eat. <laughs> for 75 cents, we give you choice uh, sea lime steak with green fritter potatoes, <laughs> rusty beef, chicken fricky sissy, and corned beef and garbage. <laughs> Vegetables, we got the uh, stream beams, the uh, green pimps, spimmies, <laughs> and hot spot of Gucci. Desserts, we got all kinds of desserts. Uh, cake, we got two kinds of cake. Apple cake and stomach cake. <laughs> we got all kinds of pies. I got special chef for pies. Uh, he makes uh, apple pie, two kinds of apple, apple and pineapple. <laughs> Cuspidor pie. Uh, lemon syringe, uh, mimps pie, two kinds of mimps, mimps and pepper mimps, <laughs> strawberry, raspberry, Hong Kong berry, oh yes, I almost forget, gooseberry. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's how Ward Wilson used to test his equipment. And Ward, how did that result in your getting a break in radio? Well, Graham, one day, Ed Whitney, one of the NBC producers, and incidentally, I hear Ed's home ill, and uh, yep. if he's listening in, we all wish him a speedy recovery. Well, he heard me doing this tomfoolery, and he thought enough of me to put me on a sustaining program called Personalities at 7-Eleven, doing imitations. It wasn't long afterwards before you had commercials of your own, in which you proved yourself to be not only the first, but the greatest mimic on the air. You won further laurels as Beatle on The Phil Baker Show. And now you're doing a swell job on many comedy shows, and thank you, Ward. Okay, sport. Mike brings you the story behind radio song plugging. That's my baby. Don't me maybe. That's my baby and how. <laughs> Haven't you ever wondered how songs are introduced over the air? How orchestra leaders get the songs they play in the first place? And why they play them and continue to play them? Well, we're going to bring you a man who is well qualified to tell you all this and more about the songs you hear through your radio. He's one of the best music contact men or song pluggers in the business, George Marlowe.
George, will you please first tell our listeners exactly what is song plugging? Well, Graham, song plugging is the business of getting songs played by orchestra leaders and sung by singers, mm. principally over the air. Each time the number is played or sung, it counts as one song plug. A song plugger, of course, works for a publisher. There are a lot of advantages to a publisher in having his music played on the air. And how, brother? You see, in the first place, radio stations pay a certain amount of money each year for the music they use. 50% of the money they receive from radio depends on the amount of plugs they get. Uh, are there any other reasons why a music publisher wants his songs played over the air, George? Well, for one thing, it widens his sheet music sales. If the listener at home hears a song played often enough, he's likely to go out and buy a copy to bat out on his old piano. And besides that, if enough important orchestra play the tunes, the smaller orchestras will go out and buy copies so they can play it too. I see. And can you sell a lot of copies to small orchestras? Graham, you may not believe it, but from our sales, we figure there are around 30,000 orchestras in this country. Wow. Now, how do you get orchestra leaders to play your songs? Persuasion. Salesmanship and friendship, it's like any other business. And do you need a lot of breaks? Like Gandhi needs a safety pin. <laughs> <laughs> there are 45 new tunes every week, and most orchestra leaders who are on the air can only use nine numbers on any one program. Now, and all those don't have to be new ones. So you see our chances. Well, where do you manage to see all these orchestra leaders? Sometimes at rehearsal, and then if they're playing at hotels, we go over to see them between numbers. I visit on an average of six or seven orchestras each evening. What arguments do you use to get orchestra leaders to play your songs after you see them? Well, of course, I try to convince them that it's going to be a hit. I'll tell you what. Let me give you a concrete example. All right. Let's say I go up to see a top-notch orchestra leader and songwriter like Johnny Green at a rehearsal of the Philip Morris, Morris program. Mm -hmm. I come into the studio and I uh, say... Uh, Let's take five. Hello, John. Hiya, George. What do you got there? I can't guess. Yeah. It's a brand new tune we've just put out, and I'd like you to look it over. It's called You Walk By. Whose tune is it, George? What difference does that make if it's a good one? Well, not a bit. It's just a songwriter's curiosity. Tell me, is it a rhythm tune or a ballad? A ballad. Love, love, and more love. George, can't I ever get a light tune to open my program with? Well, this is flexible enough to be played in most any tempo. Well, let's see it. Look at that lyric, John. I don't have to extol the merits of it to you. You're a songwriter yourself. Get a load of that line. You walk by and children pause at play. Say, that's a nice line. Let me try a few bars of this thing on the piano. Sure. <laughs> That's a very nice tune. I'd like to introduce this song, George. Could I have it exclusively for the next three weeks? It's agreeable to me. I've made no commitments. Say, I wish you'd record it. Well, George, I'll certainly give it every consideration. But when are you going to do it on the air? Let's see now. Well, we'll do it the program after next because I want to take my time over the arrangement and I'd like to play it a couple of times on the dance floor to work it in and get it well set, you know. Program after next, eh? Is that a definite date? Yes, sir. I'm sure the tune will show up, and I'll be very glad to do it for you. Thank you, Johnny. And that, Graham, is how a song plugger gets a song plug. <laughs> Thanks, George. Each week, we will invite the listeners of Behind the Mic to write us questions about radio and those we considered of most general interest, we will have answered on the air by the radio editor of some outstanding newspaper or magazine. Since the presentation of Behind the Mic was announced over various stations, we received a number of questions. Some of them will be answered now by the radio editor of the New York Post, Leonard Carlton. 
Leonard, Miss Etta Newman of Bell Harbor, New York, has this to ask. She says, for years I've heard that Fred Allen make fun of Jack Benny's violin playing. Can it be that Fred's jealous of Jack because he can't play the violin? Well, Graham, I once kidded Fred about that. He gave me an answer and put it, put it in writing. He said, No, I do not wish to play the violin like Jack Benny, if you call that playing. The violin is responsible for Jack's losing his hair. The instrument pressing against his throat is cutting off the supply of oxygen, and his hair isn't getting enough air. <laughs> Either that or his hair roots are getting discouraged at what's going on inside his scalp and are checking out. <laughs> oh, Ward, Fred couldn't have done a better imitation of himself than you just did. <laughs> Leonard, Mr. George Pfeiffer of St. Louis, Missouri writes, I have a bet with a friend of mine as to whether or not Charlie McCarthy was the first dummy to be used on the air. I said that he was not. As I remember that back in 1927 or 28, Phil Cook did a ventriloquist act with a dummy on a national hookup for a shoe account. Do I or do I not win my bet? Sorry, but Mr. Pfeiffer loses his bet. It's true that Phil Cook did a ventriloquist act, but he only pretended to use a dummy. Charlie McCarthy is the first actual dummy ever used on the radio. The first, the first dummy, understand, Graham, who wouldn't say ouch if you, stu if you stuck him with a thumbtack. <laughs> well, uh, here's a query from Miss Louise David, New York. Miss David wants to know how many hours is the average commercial half-hour variety show rehearsed? Well, for Miss David's information, the amount of rehearsal for a half-hour program is very flexible. But including music, such a half-hour program is generally rehearsed, oh, say, from eight to ten hours. And now for our last question. Miss Ann Lee Sims of 1843 North Cherokee, Hollywood, California, writes in to say, I have often heard on the radio the announcers say after a radio program, this program comes to you through recordings and electrical transcription. Will you please tell me what the difference is between a recording and a transcription? Well, I'd like to tell Miss Sims that a recording is a record made originally to be played on the phonograph, whereas a transcription is a record made especially to be played on the air. It generally runs at least 15 minutes a side. In the case of dance music, you'll find, oh, let's say about four numbers on one side of each record. This generally just about fills out the 15 minutes. In some cases, in transcriptions, you'll find the music faded down near the end of the 15 minutes so that the announcer at the studio can do a commercial announcement. Thank you, Leonard Cotton, for answering all those questions. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, en passant, as the French say. If you have any question about the inside of radio that you wish answered on the air, write a letter to us. Address it to Graham McNamee, Behind the Mic, National Broadcasting Company, New York City. As many questions as possible will be answered by mail, and the three or four questions we feel to be of most general interest will be answered on this program. Thank you. <laughs> the mic presents how a radio character played a part in a boy's fight for life. And it's now our pleasure to introduce to you the leading character in one of the airwaves most popular serials, Renfrew of the Mounted, Inspector Douglas Renfrew, known in private life as House Jameson. How exactly how did Renfrew help this boy? Well, Graham, a couple of months ago, I was at home when I received a telephone call from a stranger, a Bob Novak, who apologized for calling, and then told me a very strange and tragic story. It seems his younger brother, Johnny, a lad of 14, had been snake hunting out in New Jersey with a group of friends. Upon Johnny's return home in Englewood, he had suddenly developed stomach cramps, pain so severe the doctor had ordered him taken to the Englewood hospital at once. It was examined by specialists, and it was not snake bite. But they couldn't find out what was wrong with him, except that the boy was dangerously ill and had, except for a brief moment every few hours, spent the last three days in a coma. Bob Novak went on to tell me. Oh, Johnny. 
Johnny. Yeah, he's still unconscious, Mr. Novak. What can we do? There must be something that can be done. We're doing about everything we can. Unfortunately, the intravenous medication doesn't seem to be helping him as much as we'd hoped. Oh, but, Doctor, we can't just sit here and let him... Well, we've got one chance, a desperate one. It all depends on whether or not we can keep him awake. Keep him awake? Yes. You see, every time he goes into a coma, not only does his fever rise, but his vitality is lowered. If we could keep him out of a coma for sufficiently long intervals, we could give nature a chance to fight for him. How can we do it? Well, we might be able to do it if we could excite his interest in something and make him want to stay awake, fight off the coma. Now, what's he interested in mostly? The usual kid things, baseball, football? No, he's not much interested in sports. I'm not sure myself. Oh, well, look, Doctor, he's waking up. I'll find out while we have a chance. Uh, uh, hello, Johnny. Oh, Bob. Gee, I'm tired. Yeah, I, I know. Johnny, I, I want to ask you something. Uh, it may sound foolish, but it's important. What is it, Bob? Uh, what do you miss most since you've been here? Playing baseball with the kids or going fishing? Yeah, I miss them, I guess. Oh, what, what do you miss most? Well, I... I miss Renfrew. What's Renfrew? It's a radio program about the Northwest Mounted Police. Johnny never misses it, and whenever it's on, Johnny goes into his room and turns on his set, and you couldn't tear him away from the radio with wild horses. It's on Saturday. Well, that's tomorrow. Say, perhaps... Yes, that's... Doc, I've been thinking that. I'm going to get in touch with the man who plays Renfrew, and then I'll ask him. And then, House, he phoned you? That's right. And he told me how interested Johnny was in Renfrew. And he asked me if I couldn't send Johnny a message from Renfrew. And if there wasn't something else I could do to make Johnny want to fight off his illness. And what did you do? Well, first I sent a telegram to Johnny. And when it arrived... Johnny! Hey, Johnny! What, Bob? Here's a telegram come for you. It's signed, Inspector Douglas Renfrew. Renfrew? Yeah, and it says, Dear Johnny, I've missed having you with me on my recent trips through the Canadian Rockies. What kind of a story do you want to hear next? I'll tell it especially for you. Signed, Inspector Douglas Renfrew. Especially for me? Yeah, and here's a picture of him that he sent, autographed to you. Look. Oh, hot diggity. Say, Bob, do you think I could hear Renfrew tomorrow night? Sure, sure, Johnny. I'll, I'll get a portable radio and, and you can listen. And then what happened? Well, after the broadcast next night, I got another phone call from Bob who told me that Johnny's excitement and his desire to hear the program had kept him out of the coma, and the doctor thought that it had given him enough strength to fight it off from then on, and that he had a good chance to pull through. And Johnny Novak did pull through, and here he is to tell you so himself. Johnny, how are you feeling now? I'm much better now, Mr. McNamee. I've just returned from a vacation in New Hampshire. That's good. And you still have that picture of Renfrew, I'll bet. Yes, sir. I've got it right on my bureau. Gosh, I wouldn't be without that. Well, that was a dramatic story. And thank you, Johnny, for coming here, and thank you, House Jameson. next week when we will bring you the human interest and drama behind a radio actress's fight for a foothold in her chosen field. How one radio program actually prevented a woman listener from wrecking her married life. A thrilling dramatization of the amazing experience that befell Captain Tim Healy of Tim Healy's Stamp Club. How radio directors wishing a cast, a radio program, immediately reach the actors. And more of the human interest, the glamour, the comedy, and the drama that are found behind the mic. This is Graham McNamee speaking. Good night, all. Appearing on this is the premiere performance of the new radio feature, Behind the Mic, where radio's most loyal fan, Miss Will McGray, former page boy, Billy Livingston, orchestra leader, Johnny Green, song plugger, George Marlowe, comedian, Ward Wilson, radio actor, House Jameson, radio editor of the New York Post, Leonard Carlton, and Johnny Novak. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.